They came, they saw and they conquered. And that was the last we heard of them because they forgot a vital element for success. They forgot to keep pace with time. Welcome to Lessons in Excellence. In today's fiercely competitive business world, it's the survival of the biggest. And yet, to be big, you need to know how to grow and more important, add value to your existing business. 3M and McKinsey are good examples of companies which grew at the right time. How do companies create value? 3M, with a product line of over 60,000 products, creates value through continuous innovation and maintains profits by creating new products like Microflex circuits and pneumatic mufflers for noise-free shops. And the most popular of its products, Post-it Notes, Rim a Money Spinner. Lincoln Electric's mantra for creating value is excellence in quality. And this has remained its guiding principle for over a hundred years. To achieve this objective, it has set up high-efficiency plants with superior infrastructure all over the world. Its cutting and welding products are regarded as some of the best in the industry. And with a strong customer focus, it ensures high quality after-sales service. As for McKinsey, the customer is at the center of value creation. Customers can look forward to tailor-made solutions to their problems. With a wide array of services, ranging from banking and securities to non-profit solutions, McKinsey ensures that the customer returns with a smile. Uh, Sumantra, so in, in aligning for growth, you've said there are three key elements which allow companies to align themselves for growth. And you've used a, a, a phrase, value creation logic. Explain that to us because it sounds very suspiciously like shareholder value creation to us. No, no. Actually, it's the, the worst tragedy has been this word value being captured under the shareholder value term. Value is how, how does a company act, actually create value? Any company, you use some inputs, whether it's raw materials, people, capital, whatever, you produce some output. The output has to be seen by society as worth more than the inputs you consume. If it is not seen as more, you should go out of business. If it is seen as more, all power to you, you should grow and prosper. That's value. The, the output you produce, the goods, the services you produce, the value it provides to whoever is the customer, the end user. I'm using value creation in that sense. Mm -hmm. Are you creating value? Now you've used examples of 3M. You've used examples of McKinsey. Now, for instance, in McKinsey uh, or in 3M, you've said continuous innovation. But isn't that a value that almost every good technology company has? What is it that 3M does with it that is different? Uh, companies have very different basic logics of value creation. You, everybody may do everything, but the companies are like animals, right? A, a way to think about them. Uh, a cheetah is a fundamentally different animal than an elephant. Mm -hmm. Companies, if some companies are like elephants, other companies are like cheetahs. W what do I mean? Okay, take, take an example. GEC is a good example. Okay, uh, ITT used to be a good example. What they have is they have terrific financial discipline, financial control systems. They, they have created enormous value. What they have done, you acquire a company which is poorly managed, you impose your financial discipline on them, your tightness of management on them, you squeeze extra resources out, which creates value for the company. It's not about innovation. GEC would historically buy companies that are not very innovative, stable technology, not changing very much, because there this logic works. If GEC now buys a company, which is all about constant innovation, and applies its financial absolute rigorous discipline to that company, it will kill that company. This whole... Um art or skill that, com that that company has created of financially re-engineering, that you are saying is its value creation That's its value creation product is not? No. The, it can apply to the buy split corona, old dying typewriter company, applies that, creates value out of that. Is it a special skill that gets into the DNA of yeah, the company? Yeah, it's exactly. That. On the other hand, 3M. And how does it get, why does it get into it? Into I, the I think in this case, in many cases, it's from the founder. That's how Lord Weinstock started. It is, and then he grew out of that. 3M, on the other hand, 
His whole value creation logic is niche innovation. Cont it, uh, continuously finding niche application areas in which to leverage its almost 100 different technologies to create new products, 3 ms 60,000 products. Niche innovation, they will come up, post-it note. Some will succeed like post-it note. Others will come up for a certain period, then will drop off. But it is continued. Now, that's under the difference between GEC's value creation logic and 3M's value creation logic, which are completely different. Why does it matter? The other side, you have your organizational logic. How am I organized? If your value creation logic is like GEC, centrally driven, strong financial command and control, then your organization better reflect it. Then you better have a clean, simple, hierarchical structure, very strong CEO, departmental heads. On the other hand, if, if your value creation logic is continuous product innovation, if you create that hierarchical structure top down, you'll kill it. You need empowered frontline units, empowered people testing, experimenting, senior people acting much more as coaches, cre creating frameworks, aligning them, but not heavy hand. So when we say aligning for growth, the point we mean is you have the valuation logic, you have a basic organizational logic, and you have people processes. The early 70s. DI Cycles rode its way to industry leadership with a market share of over 50%. DI's manufacturing was vertically integrated, making all its components in-house, with its designs imported from the United Kingdom. The road ahead looked smooth, but it didn't notice competition fast closing in. Hero Cycles emerged as a successful brand by redefining the rules of competition. Product design was indigenous to meet Indian needs for a sturdier cycle capable of carrying bigger loads. Components were outsourced. Manufacturing was focused on high efficiency assembly with a production capacity of 16,500 cycles a day. In 12 years, Hero Cycles became the largest producer of bicycles in the world. A leadership position it still holds, churning out over 4.5 million cycles a year. showed the way when it shed its old skin and embraced the three mantras value creation logic, basic organizational principles and enterprising people who are managed well. All three seem to be working together. That's the point I was trying to make. Does one lead to the other? No. They they, they to, now, GEC then, with the period GEC was most successful, its organization was absolutely command and control. Lord Weinstock was a caricature command and control manager. The kind of people you'd hire are hard, rough, not particularly well-trained MBAs or technologists, top managers, often ex-army people, who will implement, absolutely go down. Now, we can look at that and say, ah, that's bad practice. Yes. Command and control. Uh, that, 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 that for him is right practice because... And that's how he's created value. The, his value creation logic, his organizational principle, and his people processes mapped. All three mapped. Now, George Simpson comes in as the CEO of GEC, replacing... Lord Weinstock, he's a modern man, so this is very bad, changes it, that's the death of our column. GEC, a hugely successful company, though copybook example of what in today's Spanish terms, we'll say bad management principles, take it over, becomes Marconi, company's dead or dying. Because you've, you've killed... You, you've killed alignment. You've you took an elephant and tried to put the cheetah's legs onto the elephant, the elephant hobbles and then falls down and dies. All through uh, your writings or all through uh, our discussions, there is this uh, need for creating nimble-footed entrepreneurial organizations. Those are the ones which succeed. But here you have a complete mirror image of that. One man runs it, you're saying dictatorially, gets 
solid army managers in and yet goes on to be successful. Yeah, they're there. The trouble is we have many examples of this. All the different littered industries, IPT. The problem with these companies typically is they come about with one man and it is almost impossible to replace that man. I think this is the difference between Lord Weinstock and Dhiruvai Ammani. Dhiruvai Ammani started one man but during his lifetime created an organization that then can take reliance and move forward. Lord Weinstock started as one man. At one level, Lord Weinstock created much more than Dhirubhai Ambani did. If you take simply in billions of dollars. But he did not build the organization that could then take what he created and move forward. The trouble with that logic was this. This is what happened to ITT after Janine. This is what happened to GEC after Weinstock. You can operate that logic, but it stops at some point. But a softer version, you take Lincoln Electric. Okay? Mm -hmm. They believe in capitalism. Genuinely believe in capitalism as a philosophy. Therefore, they believe in peace rate. L workers are paid peace rate. You produce so many pieces. Today's day and age of that worker participation, it has one of the most motivated workers in any company I've seen. Why? It selects those kind of workers. The workers believe in capitalism. You're, you have a values. You have value creation logic. You have your organization. You have your people. Unless you align them, unless they are mutually consistent, you hobble like the elephant with the cheetah's legs. I, 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 I'm, I'm excited by a little naughty thought here. Are you saying, therefore, that you can virtually get away with anachronism provided the alignment is right? You know, in fact, a company that in some way is not an anachronism is highly unlikely to succeed. <laughs> because, you know, what can you say? I'm just like everybody else. I'm in the bang in the middle. Well, that's not a success formula, right? Success, by definition, is an outlier. Every year, a thousand small companies will start. 900 will die before the end of the year. Another 80 will die before the end of three years. 20 will survive, of which 18 will be mediocre. One will be outstanding. By definition, we are talking about a phenomena where the average and the middle doesn't matter. Is the outlier that we are interested in. And the outlier can break all the rules provided? It is aligned within itself. There's a coherence. Infosys is an outstanding company. Wipro is an outstanding company. Both are in the same businesses. They are different companies. Now, if you take everything from Infosys and apply it to Wipro, it won't work. Just like all good practices from Wipro. Some you can. There is opportunity to learn. But you have to treat each company. I think that metaphor is right. Stop and ask, what kind of an animal are we? Then ask, are my legs, my head, my ears, are they matched? That's what you need. A cat is different from, a tiger is different from an elephant. Not every company has to be like Infosys or like Reliance. Bajaj Auto is a great company. Bajaj Auto's management is completely different from Infosys's. It doesn't make it any better, any worse. It is aligned within itself. 1970, the license raj. Consumers had limited choice and prices were high. For Bajaj, it was an opportunity. It became a monopolist in a supply-constrained market, producing over 100,000 vehicles in 76-77. How did it align its growth? It minimized risks, developed a conservative financial policy and focused on bringing down costs. R&D was minimized and in the absence of competition, marketing expenses were negligible. Infosys, on the other hand, had offshore software development at the core of its value creation model. And it built on this through another key element, its employees. Infosys recruited talented young professionals with commitment from middle class families and instilled in them strong organizational principles as practiced and preached by its founder N.R. Narayanamurthy. then is the recipe for consistent growth, a perfect harmony between the three essentials of value creation, organizational principles and people's processes. But companies need to create an alignment process that best suit their needs. Three key cornerstones of this alignment you are saying are these three, your value creation logic, the fact you, how you organize your businesses and how you recruit, train, keep your keep people processes. happy. But at the middle, at the middle is the company's values. Whether they're explicitly stated or not, every company 
of any size is an embodiment of value. Yeah, the, the, you know, you've also written about this whole business of leadership and culture. And sometimes the leadership mm. of a company may be at variance with the culture of the company. Do, uh, take us through the, this one. The, the, at one level, each of these things are both substitutes and complements at the same time. Leadership and culture is one example. There are others like autonomy and synergy. What do I mean by leadership and culture? Companies can survive for a certain period with weak cultures if they have strong leadership. Weak cultures is what? Give us an example. No, no, I mean, a, a, a company that does not have any kind of a coherent culture, maybe something that has just been assembled through a bunch of acquisitions. Okay. It doesn't have a culture of its own. Okay. But I, I would say right now, LVMH is a bit like that. It has acquired companies in America, uh, you know, hot candy, hot new company in California. It has Louis Vuitton, 400 year old company. It has companies in Italy. It has bought companies in, in Asia. What holds it together is a very strong leadership of Bernard Arnoux and a small group of people in the center. That's what holds it together. Alternatively, companies can survive with weak leadership for some period if it has very strong culture. Mm -hmm. Having companies like Shell, companies like Unilever, sometimes they get great leaders, sometimes they don't get great leaders. They survive through the periods of weak leadership because they have really strong, durable culture. In that sense, culture and leadership are substitutes. At the same time, they are complements. They work together. The symbiosis between strong leadership and organizational culture is best exemplified by HDFC. Top-down vision and commitment, complemented by bottom-up initiative and entrepreneurship, drive HDFC's growth. Employees are given exceptional levels of autonomy and responsibility early in their careers. This is tempered with norms such as no stars, no politics and free sharing of information. In 2002, HDFC defied a dull business environment to log 21% growth and the success story continues. Uh, we also talk about autonomy and synergy the same way. You need autonomy, you need synergy. They are complements. At the same time, they are substitutes. Interdependence, dependence. So, uh, uh, Henry and I, Henry Minsberg and I wrote an article a long time ago, and, and we, we, we compare a company to a top, mm -hmm. a spinning top. Mm -hmm. Now, the trouble with the top is, you spin it, it spins beautifully, then slowly it loses energy and falls down. All companies are inherently like that. They are always unstable. They will always need constant spinning to stay spinning. You can say, look, it's a great top. You wrote a book saying it's a great top, now the top has fallen down. Well, somebody stop spinning. Somebody's got to spin it. It is, that's what a company is like. You need, the culture is of the outside skin of the top. The spinning is the leadership. Leadership job is to constantly keep the top spinning. Keep your fingers working on that. <laughs> All right, Keith, uh, we've had this very marvelous uh, uh, exchange on this one. Take us through this whole alignment argument in any Indian company that you've seen at work. I think Hindustan Lever is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. uh, right from let's uh, the logic of it um, it's in the FMCG it totally knows uh, what its uh, products are what its services are it hires this kind of people uh, that it needs for uh, this business it um, has very few lateral uh, recruits mm -hmm. uh, tend to go straight to the MBA um, classrooms and recruits from there grows its own wood as it were if you look at its uh, financial uh, reporting systems they're very clear-cut uh, it's a functional uh, um, department-led organization. Uh, so, the, uh, so you're saying its organizing principles are clear, its people processes are clear. What is its value creation logic? Meeting perhaps the most basic, the most fundamental requirement of every human being on the earth. I don't agree. Huh? That's what it does. <laughs> I don't agree. <laughs> You need a toothpaste. Try and do without a toothpaste. Toothpaste, That's soap, right. uh, no. you toothpaste. Why do you need soap? I think it's pretty much a money-making machine. Every it business uh, definitionally you, has to no, be a money-making machine. That, no, but, but that could I, well that be that value I, creation I, logic as well. It's, it's totally, <coughs> totally, totally, totally bottom-line driven. Is that, is that... Uh, I think so. If you, it's very interesting. Go back all the way to Lord Lever. The starting of, of, uh, of so um, uh, Levers, it is about cleanliness. There is this passionate belief in some light boy so, the passionate belief, cleanliness is extreme. Today in India, light boy so, actually saves more lives than 
I think a large number of hospitals put together, we underestimate the importance of hygiene. A company that provides basic hygiene to these many Indians actually adds more value than somebody who may be making medicines that may look like more value or IT systems. Food. Fine, but I, is I that value creation that is logic what, within the company? I don't think, I don't think it, it drives from. a company. Go back and look at in the, in Unilever's core values. Then, com, then it came applying technology to make people that lives I would better. agree that I would agree so that got added then and that's I think what the, that's a wonderful value creation logic yes so leveraging technology to make people's lives better leveraging technology to make people's lives better in their daily everyday use okay so here is the bottom line your business should evolve over time you must learn to grow but with growth comes a new responsibility knowing how to manage your growth and this exactly will be our lesson in excellence next week till then Keep growing.